YouTube. There we go. Um, so we do record our meetings now, and uh, the last couple of meetings have been posted to the website. Uh, so if you go to our brand new website, uh, thanks again to Rob Neal and, and uh, uh, Alan uh, Connery for putting that together. Uh, there is a, a button to uh, access previous uh, meetings, and uh, this one will be posted uh, as soon as we uh, can, probably on the weekend sometime. So since it is recorded, um, you, it's possible that if you have your video camera on that you will be in the video. So if you don't want to be in the video, I would ask you to turn your video camera off. Um, we have a speaker tonight and uh, the presentation will be uh, uh, just under an hour in length and then there will be an opportunity for questions. If you have questions, uh, a question for the speaker, I would ask you to go into the chat room and type it in and then we will just uh, read the questions uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, our, uh, let's make sure I'm recording. I'm recording. Okay, our speaker tonight is uh, Gary Crawford. Uh, he's been, uh, how long have you been a member, Gary? Not long, but he, less than a year. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, but he has been a, uh, 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 he's worked at the University of Toronto Mississauga as a uh, professor there and an archaeologist, and he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, newly retired, so he's just getting used to uh, uh, the uh, retired life, and so of course part of that is naturally he's putting a sky sky pod up in his backyard with a telescope. So I think that's what uh, everyone should do once they retire. Um, uh, so he brings his uh, his background of archaeological botany and astronomy and uh, interest to, uh, to us tonight uh, to talk about the weird to the inspired in the world of archaeoastronomy. Uh, so this is, uh, we, we talked about this talk, uh, I guess, last uh, winter before, before COVID took place. And uh, I've been looking forward to this for, for a long time. Um, uh, his interest in astronomy goes back to uh, uh, when he was uh, a little younger, uh, years ago, when he was uh, um, in his teens, he uh, started a, an astronomy club at his high school in Kingston and has always been interested in astronomy. Uh, but I guess his archaeology uh, sort of took over for a period of time, but now he's uh, sort of coming back to, uh, to astronomy. Um, many of the, the members of the center have uh, seen uh, Gary's uh, excellent astrophotography, uh, not only of his deep sky shots, but uh, his sh amazing shots of, uh, of the sun and activity on the solar surface. So uh, uh, we're looking forward to his talk tonight, From the Weird to the Inspired in the World of Archaeoastronomy. So Gary, you have the floor. Okay. Thanks, Randy. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us on this uh, on this, uh, well, Mississauga, in Mississauga, anyway, very, very cold evening, and um, hopefully uh, we can uh, we can share some ideas about the linkages between archaeology and astronomy. And um, uh, it, as as Randy said, I I came to this uh, interested in in astronomy fairly early, but I was also interested in archaeology and. I think if this field had existed in some mature way back in the 1970s, it might have tried to tackle it, but uh, it wasn't particularly, it's been, a, it's a new field really dating to the 19, late 1960s. And um, I'll show you in a minute what was happening in the late 1960s. And some of you, some of you are probably like me, uh, certainly old enough to, um, to remember some of the crazy stuff that was going on back then. But um, the, the field has certainly matured. And for example, there's a center for archaeoastronomy. And um, I just, there's the link, to, there's the website that people can go to to check out. And there are a number of interesting books that have come out lately. Um, this is my favorite right now by um, Giulio Magli called, oddly enough, Archaeoastronomy. And he, um, he teaches a course on this. And this is a book that he uses in the in the course, so it's really, really engaging, and um, 
and worth taking a look at if you get a chance. So I've got the two words there at the top, archaeoastronomy and ethnoastronomy. And um, I, I use both words simply because the one archaeoastronomy word really means the, the nitty gritty of archaeology. And we really look at the material remains. We look at architecture, do reverse engineering, that kind of thing. And I really shouldn't be saying we because I, I look at this from afar and I'm interested in it, but I haven't really done any research on this. I just, I'm fascinated by it. Ethnoastronomy is linked to archaeoastronomy because we, we, can, we, can study the, we can study living peoples and how they understand the skies. We can go to Peru and talk to the Quechua. We can deal with um, groups like in, in the Six Nations. We can deal with the Mississaugas. There are, everyone has their way of viewing the skies and ethnoastronomy is a research area that explores that. So the two actually come together and I'm gonna show you how that works. But as I said, back in the 19, late 1960s, some of you may remember that Chariots of the Gods was all over the map. Um, Eric von Daniken was um, uh, somewhat of a, of a popular figure starting around 1968. And then in the early 1970s, they came out with a movie based on the book and, and so on. And um, you can see that the, the ranking on this is three and a half stars. I mean, I'm surprised it's that high. Um, you can still buy it. And um, I don't know whether this is a, a, a pun that's intended, but if you read the description, it says it's a work of monumental importance, sure thing, and um, discusses the shocking theory that ancient Earth had been visited by aliens. Okay, so it goes on and on, and you'd think that it would have died after that, but because that topic is so popular, he's been churning out the books over the years, and there are so many people who do what he does now, um, Philip Coppins and, uh, and, and so on, um, that uh, there's a huge industry here producing these kinds of books. And I teach a course on this, not on, not on ancient aliens, but on uh, sort of critical analysis of this, of this world, of the genre. And um, what is really intriguing is that much like so much out there. The internet is dominated by these, uh, these folks. If you try to do regular archaeological research on the internet, these, these folks are always popping up. So it's important to know how to deal with it. Now, I hope you can get the audio here. So if you're not familiar with Eric von Daniken, I want you to be a little bit familiar with him. And if you have been away from him for a while, I just want to remind you who he is. So I hope you can hear this. The lines look like airstrips. They start abruptly, they end abruptly. Looking at Nazca from the air, it looks like an airport. And it really does, because you have all these bands, wide bands that look like airstrips that are laid on top of each other, but you also have these gigantic long straight lines that go for miles and miles over valleys, over mountains. So that's the level of critical analysis that these folks are, are dealing with. So you saw these two main characters. So Eric von Daniken is one, and his, his protege, um, Giorgio Tsoukalos, is someone that the kids all know because he's become a bit of a meme. And uh, so Giorgio um, is kind of Eric Von Donneken's mouthpiece these days. And you can get a sense of their logic. It's just all sort of hand waving and isn't it kind of cool? Look at this, it must be aliens. But if we look at the Nazca lines, for example, if we take a sort of an ethno-archaeological point of view, or we can take a look and see there are, I mean, this monkey is not a landing strip. There's a hummingbird on the right. And really what's happening here in this area is that people are making these designs and they're relatively simple to make. They're not from the, the, the blasts of rockets or from 
uh, spaceships landing in the desert, and why would they land here in the first place? Okay, yeah. You can make these patterns pretty simply by um, by moving the stones. You just need to have ways to you know strings and so forth to to lay out lines, and it's not that it's not that difficult. Um, they're very easy to damage, but in other cases, they're really not that visible. So you can see at the ground level on the right that this stone pathway or that this pathway in the desert is relatively visible, but from the air, all you see are these dendritic patterns of water flow that have something like you might see on Mars, for example, but with some scratches going across them. So not all that obvious. Um, and what we do know about them is that um, I mean, people weren't making them in modern days of modern the modern day, of course, but environmental research has gone on here. And what seems to have happened when these lines were being created was that this region was in a horrific drought. And these lines appear to have been um, lines in which ceremonies, rituals were taking place. People were walking them. People were were undertaking these these um, uh, these ritual walks to communicate with the deities in the skies to produce rain. I mean, it's fairly simple, it seems. And when the Nazca lines were abandoned, a whole new area of the uplands in Peru became occupied. So we can see people staging their um, their activities in here. So. There's nothing to do with the skies here, no astronomical connections at all, yet the, um, the ancient astronauts people would convince you otherwise. Um, and, and here's another approach. The reason why statues like this were carved and bizarre stories were told about beings descending from the sky was not because it was fantasy because you don't carve something like this if it were just in the figment of reimagination and it was you know you, you just do it for an invisible entity it had to be something way more compelling and in my opinion that was multiple extraterrestrial visits in the remote past right really really clear right so you know, um so the first image he just showed, it was about a quarter of a second, was of a, of a figurine in, um, from Japan, from the archeological record in Japan. And fortunately, I've spent a lot of years working in Japan. So um, let's just want to explore this a little bit. Here's a Russian guy and he's identified as a collector and expert. Um, in the archeological world, anyone identified as a collector and an expert in this context is actually a looter. He's involved in the illegal antiquities trade, but let, that's beside the point right now. Let's, let's hear what he has to say about these dolls. This is one of the famous dogus of Japan. These figurines were found on the island of Hansu. They are at least 5,000 years old. Kazantsev, the Russian collector and expert, gave us his explanation of them. In my opinion, these figures represent astral beings seen on Earth. Their sealed helmets are equipped with a breathing apparatus. Vision is afforded by glasses with narrow slits, like the Eskimos wear to avoid snow blindness. Probably they were accustomed to weaker light on their home planet. The cosmic clothing they wear seems inflated, as though to compensate for the higher atmospheric pressure on Earth. Their hands are not at all like human hands, but like mechanical claws. If you suggest they were but images of gods, I would ask you how their creators could have portrayed their technical accessories so accurately without having seen a model. These people in Japan were actually depicting space travelers that they saw, I guess, landing and walking around in Japan. And um, yeah, would, would it, wouldn't that be interesting if that were true? But what they have to avoid discussing is the actual archaeological record. So the culture that they're referring to is, is known as the Jomon. And I've been doing research on them for about 45, 50 years almost. And the blue indicates how long they've been around. They've been long, around. This pe these people existed for about 14,000 years. They, and um, 
Uh, we know about their way of life. They're, we know the types of architecture they, they built. These are what we call semi-subterranean houses. And um, we've ex they're just very common, and this is the way they would have looked. So we're dealing with people who are relatively egalitarian, although they had some, some type of social complexity. And we know about some of their feelings and their belief systems. For example, here's a burial in which we see an offering of stone tools, and there are two plaques, clay plaques, buried in this, in this pit with them. And they're, they're footprints of toddlers or babies. And these are either um, children who died or the adults died, and they took imprints of the feet of their children with them after death. So these are people with feelings and technical skill. They made incredible pottery. And these figurines are a hallmark of Jomon culture, but they're not all guys dressed in spacesuits. Um, they are so variable. And here are a couple of examples. And the one on the left is one that was excavated in the town that I worked on and worked in in Hokkaido back in around 1975 and 1976. It's hollow. And what we can see is that. Um, is, is likely tattooing on this individual. The arms are broken off and there were two sort of protrusions from the head on these dolls that were broken off. And this doll was covered in lacquer and had obviously been kept in a family or in, in a lineage for generations and the lacquer wore off and then it was ritually killed. It was buried uh, after the arms and these protru protrusions from the head were broken off. And, and so this, this clearly has some kind of religious ritual, ritual significance to these people. And there's another figurine on the right to give you an example of, of another form. And we get other forms like these kinds of biscuits and why they didn't propose some kind of Klingon um, um, similarity, I'll never know, but they could have run with that. But um, there's so much variation in these things. And here's an individual who is seated in almost a praying uh, manner and um, and uh, you know the, what these folks are saying is that if we want to make these into spacemen, we've got to um, ignore all the other all the other features. Now here are two examples of these uh, alien astronauts, and what we really see are are um, complex hair styles. We see perhaps snow goggles, um, jackets on the one on the left with decorations. Um, and then one on the right is certainly more elaborate, probably clothing with decorations and possibly even tattoos. But um, I, it, this is the idea that if you, if you want it to be something, then you can argue that it is, but you need to look at all the evidence. So now just to give you another example of taking an ethnographic approach, and this, this particular example doesn't have anything outrageous associated with it. So I'm not gonna say anything about ancient aliens or, or wacko ideas here, but um, uh, one of our members wondered if I'd say something about medicine wheels. So I thought I would add this to the discussion. Um, there are about 70 of these structures known across Western Canada and the north, Northwestern US, particularly Wyoming and Alberta and a little bit into Saskatchewan. And um, there are so many different types. These medicine wheels don't all look alike. The one in Alberta on the right is simply a circle with a couple of extensions from it. The drawing on the left shows you a range of characteristics of them. And particularly at the Bighorn, Wyoming, um, an archaeologist named Eddie tried to demonstrate in 1974 that there were astronomical alignments here. For example, you can see that he proposed there was a summer solstice sunrise, which, which arguably could, could make sense. Uh, winter solstice uh, is, may also be uh, recognizable in these alignments, but then there's some connections with Rigel and Aldebaran and Sirius and so forth. And, um, with a thousand stars, you know, plus or minus visible at, at night out here, uh, with all of these spokes and arrangements, you're bound to get alignments with something. Um, you need repeatable patterns. There is one other 
uh, stone circle that has some resemblance to this one without the spokes. And there may be some alignments here as well, but they're not particularly clear. Um, in 19, um, oh, when was it? Uh, oh, I, I guess 2002, yes. Um, a Liebman published a paper where he tried to pull a great deal of evidence together and he actually used information from the uh, Lakota and Pagan uh, indigenous peoples and finds that the sacred spaces are often associated with things like vision quests. They're, they're located in really auspicious locations, places with spiritual power. They're sacred places. Um, one of the things that's interesting is the 28 spokes in the big horn um, wheel. And it's similar to a netted hoop that's used in a game and in a bison hunting ritual. There's another kind of curious observation that since four and seven are factors of 28, um, and, and four and seven have symbolic importance to these, these folks, the, the, the number may simply be um, a sacred number. And there's really no convincing evidence at the moment that these things are primarily astronomical. They have more spiritual and, uh, and sacred meaning to people. And this is where we get a little bit, where it can get very confusing. When you're trying to reverse engineering these types of structures, you have to understand that, or we need to understand that, that small scale populations and relatively egalitarian societies are not particularly worried about specific days that something is going to happen. They're not, um, they're not um, concerned about, about particular, particular times and necessarily other than perhaps the beginning of winter, the ending of winter, that kind of thing, when rituals should be performed. So, um, so we find that, um, that, that the, the structures that are complex related to astronomy are not particularly anticipated to exist in, in these kinds of contexts. Another issue is we need to get into the heads of people who are creating these things. And, how, and so um, that's why it's important to, to either collaborate with indigenous people or to at least make sure you talk to them and uh, some archaeologists our archaeologists are guilty of not doing that and certainly the folks like von Doniken and uh, Giorgio Tsoukalos and the likes would never uh, I think talk to local people to get information that was different from their opinion so to speak. So we, another example is the Quechua and the Andes. They have a very different way of looking at the stars than say the Greeks or we do from a scientific perspective. I mean, they, they do name about 48 stars. You have two types of constellations. Uh, if, they, if they link up stars, they're really referring to inanimate objects. Um, if they're referring to animals in the sky, they're referring to those dark spaces in the Milky Way. So for example, you have a toad and a yama and fox and serpent represented in those dark spaces. So they're their view of constellations is not exactly the same as mine. The Milky Way is actually considered to hold real water. And, um, and, and that water is being transported into the cosmos where it's returned to the earth in the form of rain and so forth. And how you would read that from, from um, architecture and, from, and from a society that doesn't have written records in the past is beyond me. It's really quite difficult. And, and so there, are, the toad, for example, hibernates in this part of the world. It reawakens and begins to mate in the fall. And that's precisely when the toad constellation is rising too. So there is this connection between the skies, the deities, and the, and, and the world in which people live. And, um, and uh, there's maybe an attempt to, there's no, it's not really an attempt to explain in a scientific way what's going on. It's, it's an effort to, to interpret and integrate and affect the deities and have the deities respond to you and having a good wet season and so forth. So there's a complexity here that we really have to keep in mind. 
So this will come become a little relevant later on when we look at some some of these strange ideas these people are proposing. One of the ideas that you'll see is that um, people like Von Doniken and others believe that the Egyptian pyramids appeared suddenly out of thin air, that they had no precedent. Well, there is precedent and we know the long history of them. And the oldest structure in the world, if not uh, certainly Egypt, if not the world, is a site called Nabta Playa with a stone arrangement dating to about 7,000 years ago. Now, it doesn't look like much, but if you look at this, there's a relatively accurate north-south line, which is not that tricky to achieve. And then there is a line that goes sort of east-west, but it's not perpendicular to north and south. The reason being that it actually lines up with the summer solstice sunrise. And what we find is that people in these egalitarian small scale societies are well aware of the cardinal directions. They're well aware of the solstices. That is these um, times during the year, the two times during the year when the sun seemingly stands still in the sky in its annual round. And I'll show you something more on that in a second. So this is what they're seeing. The other, there's another crucial factor here too. If we look at the sun on June 21st, at roughly midday, it hits the zenith. And of course, when you're at the zenith, the sun is directly overhead and those stones standing in that structure are not going to cast a shadow. And that would, so you've got the alignment plus the lack of shadows indicating an onset of the, of the rainy season. So, um, there's something going on here, uh, very simple, but they're not communicating with space people. They're not traveling into outer space. And certainly, they're, if, if this is all ancient aliens are teaching them, they better get their, 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 uh, their money back. It's not working. The next kinds of alignments we see are around a couple of thousand years later. We can go to Ireland and visit New Grange and a, an amazing, amazing structure, stone laid over uh, with earth and so forth. But what you'll see here is this entranceway, there's, a, there's an entrance exit to the structure that is lined up along, let's see, get my labels here properly. So this is also, if I get, if you look at the left closely, you can see we're dealing with December 21st. Now, we're dealing we're dealing with um, with the uh, with um, uh, the December twenty first sunrise, and um, we can look at December twenty first as well. If we go to Malta, there's a structure. It has the same orientation as New Grange. Um, I doubt that these people were communicating with each other, but there is there's some important relevance to this sunrise on December twenty first. So there is an alignment, but it's not particularly, it's not particularly um, 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 complicated. Now, the, the, the book that kind of broke open archaeological astronomy back in the, or the study that actually broke this open was in the late 1960s by um, Gerald Hawkins, an astronomer at, at Harvard who did an analysis of Stonehenge that I think just went way overboard, where he, he felt that uh, Stonehenge was his computer. So if you look at the right diagram, you see these, these pits called Aubrey holes. He figured out that if you had moving stones in a certain way, you can actually uh, run this as, a, as an eclipse calculator, an eclipse computer. Um, but um, there's so many ways that, that that could work, that that's really a pattern imparted by the astronomer, not something that's actually in the archaeological record. That's probably been in the last 15 years that considerable research has been done on Stonehenge in a much more mature way. Everything from looking at the acoustics of this structure to looking at the astronomy. And certainly there are alignments, such as the summer solstice sunrise, as you can see in this diagram. Uh, but it's not the be-all and end-all of this structure. 
in terms of alignments, it fits with what was going on in Europe at that time when we look at places like Newgrange and, um, and Malta. And um, the nice thing about astronomy software these days, my, um, my Starry Night uh, application comes with uh, Stonehenge as a horizon. And you can actually go back and, and look at the winter solstice sunset alignment here. Bang, right where, right where it should be. But this isn't because people were calculating um, eclipses or measuring astronomical um, uh, phenomenon and creating a secular knowledge about astronomy. This would relate to the way that they perceive the world, the way they see their world as being connected to the skies. And in some ways, you're, you're paying homage to deities by conducting ceremonies at the right time to make sure that either the sun is going to return uh, and start having longer days um, and, um, and other kinds of things like that, having feasts at the right time. Uh, it, it's, so it's, it's um, at that level. But what happens when we get into cities, when society becomes even more complex with complex political systems, um, so the best place to go to start is, let's go to Mexico and take a look at Teotihuacan. So here's where we're going to get into some more strange ideas. Now, just take a look at this. The people who constructed this vast city possessed a sophisticated knowledge of ma so mathematics, here that astronomy, this and engineering. Mathematics and engineering. Eric von Danigan believes the builders of Teotihuacan might have been taught the secrets of our solar system so they were by teachers by from astronauts. above. This here is called La Avenida de los Muertos, the Avenue of the Dead. This represents a model of our solar system. For every so planet, you a bit more about there this is a construction a building. Quite clearly, there are nine planets in our solar system, all orbiting around the sun. You heard him say there are nine planets orbiting Mercury. our solar system, and he's going to talk about Pluto. Again, this is another case where they, where maybe um, uh, deGrasse Tyson should have actually spoken to some ancient aliens first instead of trying to get Pluto not be a planet. ...is nearest to the sun. Pluto is the furthest. At Teotihuacan, each one of the planets is represented by a building, ruin, or marker. Eric von Danigan believes it is a remarkably accurate scale model of our solar system. So they think this is an accurate model of the solar system. On the hill behind the pyramid of the moon are the ruins of temples which could represent the last planets discovered in our solar system, Neptune and Pluto. In this way and then on the other side of this pyramid there is some representation of Pluto. Okay, so Absolutely we can, we can go now, Pluto was, so they're was really, they really in this... get excited about the fact that Pluto is part of this model. Uh, again, um, a little out of date here. They're, they're forcing the data to, to, their, to their model. So here's what they're trying to say. If we take a look at, Te at Teotihuacan, we have, um, I guess, the Pyramid of the Sun here and we have the planets revolving around it, and each of these circles representing an orbit of a planet is delineated by a particular, by a temple. And you can see these associations. Well, let's, let's take a look at this a little closer. Uh, what, what if we actually looked at the real archaeological data? So here's a map of Teotihuacan. Now let's just turn it so it lines up, and there you have it. So those red buildings are all uh, temple structures. And what you can see is that they were cherry picking. You can draw any number of circles you want to, or they didn't even draw ellipses, of course. Uh, I, guess, uh, I guess the space travelers didn't know about ellipses in, that, in those days. But um, here, you, here you, can, you can see that you can draw any number of circles you want to fit any pattern that you want. So um, what we have to figure out is what really was going on in Mexico, or at least Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, these areas. What kind of, of cosmic 
uh, or view of the cosmos did these people have? Um, and it gets worse. Uh, you may be familiar with this case, but let's take a look at it. Let's go to Palenque. Let's drop in and take a look at this rather important archaeological site because it's about the only uh, site in which a king is, is entombed in one of those pyramids. Those pyramids are temples. They're not meant to be tombs, but this one was. And it roughly dates, and it dates to this period. So I just want to show you the sequence in which this, this fits in. So here's, here's the story that you, you may or may not be familiar with. Mainstream scholars believe the depiction is of King Pakal on a journey to the underworld. Their term mainstream scholars is actually meant as kind of an insult to us. But ancient astronaut theorists believe the king is portrayed seated at the controls of a spacecraft and have dubbed him the Palenque astronaut. Right, it looks like an astronaut, right? He appears to be going into space. He's the original rocket man. There, manipulating his spacecraft, going into space. We have maintained for a very long time that the depiction here is of King Pakal sitting in some type of a spacecraft because he is at an angle like modern day astronauts upon liftoff. He's manipulating some controls right here. He has some type of a breathing apparatus or some type of a telescope in front of his face. His feet are on some type of a pedal and down here, you have something that looks like an exhaust with flames. There's a psychiatrist in the audience. It probably is some really terrific material for analysis here. But um, so here's the lid and, and, and in its raw form. And we'll look at some of the symbolism in this in a second. And this is really what they're saying is that they've got an astronaut here. And um, but what's really going on here is that if you if you look at whoops if you look at this diagram, there is a clearly an axis running uh, down the center of of the lid, and it's long and linear. There's some kind of a creature up here. This is another type of a creature down here. We'll look at in a second, and really what that that vertical axis represents is this um, is this ceiba tree. It is the largest tree in this part of the world, and it symbolizes joining the underworld. So the Maya had, had sort of three realms. There's the underworld, there's the terrestrial realm, and then there's the skies, the heavens. And this tree is represented by a cross throughout Mayan art and writing. So that's what's depicted, not, not a rocket. Um, they didn't do their homework. And here you can see examples of how it's illustrated in other, for, in other, in other works. Um, so what's happening here is that you're seeing um, at the top, you see the celestial bird deity, and it represents the supremacy of the heavens. Um, below the, um, the king is the sun monster or god, and, and it's partly skeletonized. Um, and then we have the underworld where benevolent souls go. And there are about nine levels of the underworld, each with a deity. And it's actually a pretty good place to go, uh, unlike in, in, in Judeo-Christian um, uh, traditions, uh, the underworld has, has other connotations. And, um, and so this tree is a bridge among, among these worlds. What we're seeing, of course, is it's the sarcophagus lid. We have a king who has died, and the lid simply depicts all of the mythology about the king and, and where the king will be going in the afterlife and who's influencing this, this dead king. Um, and then the Milky Way is also associated with this world tree, the Seba tree. And it's considered also to be a path that Pakal would be 
taking to the underworld. So um, it, it's the it's the kiss rule, right? Just keep it simple, guys. And um, why this Mayan leader would be jetting off into space, I'm not sure. I guess they're trying to argue that um, the leaders were down teaching people things and they're going to go back home to whatever planet they came from, but it just doesn't work. In terms of astronomical knowledge, um, we're certainly well aware of the three calendars that the Mayans had. I don't want to get into that, but what we can see is that there were astronomers who were involved to some extent in the planning of these buildings. And I'll just give you a few examples of, of how we are aware of this. So this is the Temple of Kukulkan at, at Chichen Itza. And let's take a look. Look at, of course, the sunset at, during the spring equinox is directly west. Boom, there you go. What do we get? Look at, take a look at this. So here's the sunset at the spring equinox, and uh, it is not going to be hitting this pyramid, this temple of Kukulkan directly. You'll see that it's angled, and it's angled about 17 degrees from north. So take a look at this. So what we're going to see is an interplay of that corner of the wall and this staircase, which has two serpents going down the stairs. And I imagine many of you like me have actually gone here to see this. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to go there during, during the spring equinox, but uh, maybe someday when we can travel again, I'll be down there. But um, so here's what that serpent looks like. And this is actually the god Kukulkan, who, among the Aztecs is, is actually Quetzalcoatl. Kukul Khan um, at one point was a, was a vision um, deity associated with vision quests, as I understand it. And eventually when, when, uh, Te Te when uh, Chichen Itza was flourishing, um, the uh, Kukul Khan became a, a more um, a, a supreme kind of deity. And, um, and what we see here at this temple in honor of Kukul Khan, in a sense, is this interplay of shadow and light. And this is a really interesting video. So you'll see in the equinox, you'll see the serpent gets connected and, it, and in a sense you're, you're seeing the serpent slither down the stairs. And one idea, if we, if we go back to this previous slide, here is the, the staircase. You can see the staircase where the um, Kukul Khan, the serpent, is depicted. And then there's a road that goes to a cenote, the sacred, the sacred um, uh, waters. And one possibility, according to Julio, um, Julio, Julio Maglia, is that the, is the serpent actually maybe symbolically going to this cenote. So we, um, so we get back to this, there's that video again. And, and so what we're seeing is more, more theater and, and um, showing interplay of light and shadow connected to a particular day that's crucial. So again, we're seeing the sun uh, in relationship to these people and what about something else? So the rain god, Chak, is crucial here because Chak is going to control rainfall for, um, for agriculture and so forth. And the Mayans had some very specialized way and ways in controlling water, collecting water, and using water. And Venus is very closely associated with Chak as well. So let's take a look at Ushmal, about 130 kilometers from Chichen Itza. These are buildings named by archaeologists, of course, the Governor's Hall, Pyramid of the Magicians, and of course, many, many other structures here. There's a ball court in the, in the foreground. Now, if we look at Chichen Itza, about 17 degrees off north, if we take that line over to Ushmal, there's a very similar alignment, except for the, the Governor's Building. If we look at this building, it's about 28 degrees. And what 
so this building, um, number three, has depictions of chalk, it has depictions of Venus, and it has the number eight associated with it. And what do we find? This line perpendicular to this 28 degree line actually marks the extreme of the Venus rising in an eight year cycle. And so there's clearly, I mean, we don't know specifically what's going on here, but it, it does seem to show the relevance of Venus the, and, um, and the observation of Venus over long periods. And there may, and one possibility is that that is that this pyramid here may have been simply, this may also have been uh, a sight line or an area to actually just watch Venus rising with this palace and uh, this governor's building in the foreground. So there are lo lots of interplay going on here. And there is no evidence of, of, um, of an observatory. Um, there was suggestions of uh, this caracal at Chichen Itza being an observatory, but lots of measurements have been made and they're kind of odd and no one, no one really accepts that it's a true observatory. So we can go further north now. Let's go into, um, let's go into New Mexico, uh, to Chaco Canyon, where between 830 and 1150 AD, we see some fascinating things going on. And I've connected these two sites, they're about six and a half kilometers apart, we're about a mile high in elevation as well, just to give you some context. But um, this is the um, this is in Chaco Can Canyon, and this is a single building. It's massive, but it's a single building with with a whole group of kivas, which are sacred buildings, sacred rooms. The alignments are relatively precise, particularly this east-west line. And so there, there certainly is concern about the cardinal directions. Not only that, but if you go north from the Chaco Can Canyon area, there is a road, a road that these Chaco people built. Um, they built it over rough terrain, over tough landscapes. They kept it going straight and it's dead north-south. And these directions have spiritual importance and they're connected to death, dying, where spirits are traveling. And, um, and so we again see this connection with the spiritual world. There's no secular um, astronomy here. The main way that people kept time with the seasons was by using what's called a horizon calendar. And when you have a, a rugged horizon like this, you have, you have key areas where if you see the sun at a particular time, you can then begin to predict how many days it will be until the, uh, the, either the equinox or the, the solstices. And um, the Hopi, for example, had specialists, um, a sun priest who was the keeper of the knowledge of the sun and its movement. And, uh, and, and that person would have passed that knowledge on to their successor. Not everyone had this knowledge. The kinds of things they needed to be prepared to observe is something like this at Casa Rinconada. We're standing right next to Casa Rinconada, the largest of the great kivas that we know of in the whole Chaco system. When the sun comes up on that day, which is June 21st, it will come through this window, it will come across the kiva floor, a rectangle of light, and then over a period of about 20 minutes, that light, that rectangle, will move down and settle into one of the 34 niches, or niches, around the inside of this building. And it will happen for about a week. This solstice sun stands still, that's what solstice means. So again, it's, it's a demonstration of of uh, knowledge and predictability of, of the world. There has been some uh, debate about another, uh, another structure. This is the one six and a half kilometers away from that large kiva. There are these, uh, there are these slabs of stone that uh, have, have fallen and create light play behind them. And this behind them, people have carved a spiral. 
And if we go back in behind, you can actually catch a glimpse of this spiral here. And the question is, is this an accurate calendar? And so we, here we have the summer solstice being represented by essentially a, a knife of light passing through the center of this. And you can see in the diagram on the left that the solstices are also marked. And here's an animation that shows, that shows the solstices um, as well as the equinox. So take a look at this. There, boom, there we are, the winter solstice, summer solstice. And the equinox is kind of in the middle there. Um, so uh, I think I think what we're seeing here is is more a um, this is what we might call a um, a um, uh, a uh, sort of a, a sun. Uh, what's the word? Sun temple. It's a location where the sun priest goes to make other observations and to worship, but considering how the speed of the way that shaft travels over the year through that relatively small spiral, it's very, very difficult to make predictions. The predictions are much better. They have higher resolution if you're using a horizon calendar. So this is more likely a ceremonial kind of, kind of structure. Uh, there's a, something, did they, see the, um, did they see the crab nebula supernova? Somebody suggested that if you look at this, uh, if you go back to 1054, um, there's the moon, there's the crab nebula. They probably wouldn't have seen it quite like that, of course, the crescent moon. Um, but uh, the, the jury is out on this one, but most people believe this is simply depicting a star in the moon, not necessarily the, um, the supernova that even the Chinese did see. Uh, so going further north to Cahokia, where we have the largest urban center north of Mexico in North America. It's, it's massive. Some population estimates are as high as 50,000, but reasonably they might have been 20,000. And, and uh, it also has pyramids. These aren't stone, but they're made of earth. And these are also temples. And to the west of that large temple mound, in the background there is what we call a wood henge. And there are some alignments that archeologists have been able to discern. And uh, if you look at this particular diagram, um, looking at the, um, looking at the, uh, at, at this uh, summer salsa sunrise, you can, there's some alignment here. There's, um, uh, but how precise it is, it's not clear. One of the things we do know about uh, Cahokia is it was very much a, a place for, for sort of theatrical representations of, of, of what's going on in the world, for rituals, massive communal rituals took place at this, at this site. And we look at the alignments from this wood henge this site is laid out on, an e on a north, south, east, west grid, no question. But the summer solstice sunrise doesn't seem to have a particularly auspicious alignment. But if we look at the, um, the equinox here, you can see how a, how a view from that wood hinge takes you to one edge of that large temple pyramid. And so people have tried to to take a look at this. So this is a, 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 you know, sorry for the resolution, but here's an equinox sunrise at Cahokia. And again, it's a type of theater, it's a type of vision to show people in a sense that the world is unfolding as it should, the deities are, are, um, are, uh, are, are going to be coming through. So it's getting a little bit more sophisticated as societies get more complex. And of course, we need to take a look at Egypt. So I want to wrap up with Egypt. And of course, there are all kinds of interesting things, right? There are two guys that have created a bit of an industry around, around Egyptian uh, archaeology. New breed of investigators is asking questions and challenging that idea. Sluice like Robert Bovel, a construction engineer and writer Graham Hancock. Graham Hancock is 
a, is a, is a writer, um, a journalist, um, and uh, Boval is, a, is an engineer. And they have some pretty, pretty curious ideas about what's going on here. For example, let's, I'll show you this clip. Boval and Hancock began to believe the 5,000-year-old monuments were built to send a message yeah, to future they, generations. They were built to send a message of some sort. Um, they're not clear on what that message is, but there's a message. 7,000, 8,000, 9, 10, and in 10,500 BC, that's when we get the perfect match. It's absolutely so amazing. Well, the whole arrangement freezes the time of 10,500 BC. The pyramid builders made their terrestrial map to reflect Orion as it looked and only as it looked in 10,500 BC. But why? Hancock has a theory he knows sounds incredible. He likes to speculate that the idea of the pyramids was inherited from another culture, one that existed in 10,500 BC. That culture disappeared, but somehow their advanced knowledge of architecture, mathematics, and science was passed down through the ages. With that knowledge, the Egyptians of 2,500 BC built the pyramids. The monuments Hancock suggests are part of a legacy from a lost civilization. We're not claiming that uh, the pyramids are 12 and a half thousand years old. What we're saying is that the pyramids speak of that very distant date. There's no doubt in my mind that the Egyptians were the inheritors of an ancient knowledge and wisdom. It's absurd to suggest, as Egyptologists do, uh, that these monuments were the creation of the infancy of a civilization. There's a huge accumulated knowledge and wisdom expressed in these monuments. These monuments, to me, are the end of something, not the beginning of something. So they like to speculate about things, and, and he, he doesn't really come out and say it, but I'm just going to stop it there. But really what he's referring to without saying it is Atlantis. And of course, before 1882, virtually no one had heard of Atlantis except, you know, Greek scholars who had read Plato. And Ignatius Donnelly, a lawyer in the U.S., published uh, this book called Atlantis, the Antediluvian World in 1882, where he proposed that Atlantis was the ancestor to all civilizations. And of course, it was, it was pretty, it's, it's nonsense because Atlantis was a, was a story that Plato made up. But, but um, these two characters who go on about Egyptian society and what it represents uh, will not actually come out and say that that mysterious 10,000 BC or 12,000 year old pick a date society is Atlantis. And that's, that's really what they're driving at. And Atlantis taught these people something, but it just doesn't, it doesn't work. In terms of these being the oldest megalithic structures in the world or in this part of the world, they're, they're completely wrong. There's something rather fantastic going on in Turkey around 11,000 to 9,000 years ago at Gobekli Tepe. I mean, this is really outstanding. These, these sanctuaries, uh, 20 of them, with these massive stone structures uh, were being built by relatively egalitarian societies. And people have been wondering whether there are clues to astronomy in these structures. And there's only, there's only I mean, the, the, the fringe has gone crazy with this stuff, but we're not gonna get into that right now. But there is an interpretation of one of these, a diagram on one of these stones that goes like this. So this stone is in three parts. Altars to the sky deities on the top. Uh, this, um, a vulture is holding in a wing this sphere, which uh, the archaeologists who interpreted this is suggesting that it's Egypt. I mean, Egypt, what am I saying? I'm getting tired here. Is in this context is considering that it is Venus. So 
why would Venus have any relevance at this particular time? And this actually loops back to something that Boval and Hancock were referring to. This is what they're referring to. Back around that time, because of precession, um, we would not be seeing the night sky the way we see it today. So let's, let's, let's slow that up again. You see, right, you just see peeking over the horizon from this location is Sirius. And there's Sirius just peeking up as is Orion's belt. And so one possibility is around this time, the first appearance of Venus and Orion's belt are particular, um, um, I keep saying, I keep, I keep saying Venus, but I mean, I mean Sirius. So uh, sorry about that. Um, a slip, a Freudian slip. So we're talking about Sirius, not Venus. And Sirius is, is popping up above the horizon. And uh, of course, today, Sirius is about 30 degrees above the horizon. But back in those days, it wasn't. So is there some kind of recognition that this new star and constellation has appeared? It's a bit of a stretch. But that's about all we know. Now, they are also claiming in this Orion mystery book that Orion is somehow mapped onto uh, ancient Egypt and that the Milky Way represents the Nile, that Orion's belt represents the arrangement of the pyramids of, um, of Giza. And so the argument is like this. If you take the belt of Orion, the three stars are not exactly lined up. And so Boval is saying that the, the peaks of the pyramids are not lined up either, and they seem to match Orion's belt. Depending up on what direction you look at, um, they could be, um, you know, could be bent the other way, but we needn't really get into that. Um, the key here, though, is that these pyramids are lined up precisely on the southeastern corners. And the reason that this uh, southernmost pyramid is small is simply because uh, there wasn't enough space to build a large pyramid. And it's simply a spatial kind of thing, too. So um, a more kind of Egypt, Egypt sensitive interpretation is this. And I'm referring to a wonderful book by Derek Hitchens, who wrote about the pyramids. He has this book called The Pyramid Builder's Handbook. And he interpret it, interprets this in the context of Egyptian society in the time, that these pyramids were not encoding, or that the whole Egyptian landscape was not some interpretation or some map of the cosmos, that in fact we're seeing something else. So we have the capital of the Old Kingdom at Memphis to the south, the Nile being the main form of transportation, the main area of habitation at the time. And if you were looking from Memphis or traveling along the Nile to the north to inspect those pyramids, you would have had this tremendous view of the pyramids all lined up on the horizon. And Hitchens has this wonderful photograph pre-Aswan Dam era that shows this. If you look at the pyramids from the desert perspective, they're, they're jumbled. They're not lined up in any particular way, but they have a beautiful alignment. Uh, Khufu, who was, the, who was the pharaoh to be buried here, um, took on the nickname of Horizon Khufu. And Horizon actually ha had a crucial sort of symbolic role in, this, in, in the resurrection of, uh, of the pharaoh. And so all of this has to do with the afterlife and the resurrection of the Pharaoh and visualizing this resurrection in a symbolic way. And so the pyramids, in a sense, would be uh, symbolizing this resurrection viewed from there. And in terms of the pyramids developing suddenly, we'll know. Um, archaeologists have, a long, have, have uncovered the long history of development um, and we have um, Nab to Playa back in here. So we have astronomical knowledge being, being developed back as early as 6,500, 7,000 years ago. Um, 
an amazing, so a mysterious, ancient, wise society passing on information directly to those people from some kind of an archive stored below the Sphinx is simply a, um, a made up story to fit their, to fit their model so that they can sell books. It doesn't work. So um, I guess we're really going over time, but um, I just wanted to end with another uh, sort of, it's not particularly controversial subject, but it's a subject that some archeologists are debating right now. And this debate will hopefully, hopefully resolve uh, some issues. But let's go back 20,000 years, 25,000 years. There's certain bones that have been recovered that have these patterns on them and they seem to be tallying something. Alexander Marshak back in the 60s suggested these were tallying the lunar phases and the lunar cycle. And some um, people interested in gender and archeology span are suggesting that maybe women were doing this to track cycles, for example. But let's take another look at this final example before we wrap up. This upper Paleolithic art tradition in France and Spain is absolutely astounding. Um, so we have a tradition that makes um, cubism and, um, and, and so forth look, look like they were just flashes in the pan. Th this tradition lasted for 25,000 years where extraordinary uh, works of art were created in the depths of caves where very few people would have had an opportunity to see them. So they're in weird places that weren't like art galleries, but to some extent, that's what they look like. So what's going on here? So you get representations of hands. These representations of animals are so lifelike. And then you get marks and symbols that are difficult to interpret. Um, here you have bison. One of them is molting and the other one is not. This may represent uh, seasonality, but these are really terrific representations. And here's another, um, here's another guy, probably an auroch with dots on its face or dots that were painted before or after. Um, in terms of their grasp of reality, and keep in mind that they're not taking these animals in the cave and saying, hold still, model for me, I'm gonna draw you. They're doing this from memory. Here's a drawing of a horse. This is a photograph of Przewalski's horse, which is the wild ancestor of the domesticated horse. I mean, they are virtually identical to, down to the placement of the legs. Now I'm, I've got some questions about the tail and the head, but it could be that the head is actually, um, some, of the, some of the illustration of the head may simply be, be missing on this guy, but the coloring, the form is, is so accurately represented that people are very concerned with accuracy. Some have suggested that constellations or, um, or uh, or asterisms are represented here, such as the Pleiades. Could, maybe this is the Pleiades here. There's a bit of a debate going on. And um, I just want to introduce you to this woman's concept of what might be going on here. This is the hypothesis that she's published and that people are currently scrutinizing. For years, archaeology and astronomy had been mutually exclusive Actually, disciplines. Actually, let me just scrub through but this. What she's been doing is measuring, uh, she's doing alignment work, she's been measuring these, these areas, and what she's discovering is that on a particular day, and you won't be surprised by what day this is, the sun enters this cave and lights it up completely and brings these paintings to life in a sense. And what do we see happening? So let's take a look at the sun. And uh, this is, just want to speed this up so folks can see this annual uh, path of the sun. So I fixed the time just randomly at 5.40 p.m. and I'm only changing the date. And so you're seeing the sun in the summer going to its standstill point, going back to the equinox, and then going back to this winter 
stand still point, slowing down, turning around, and coming back. And it forms this type of a shape known as an, an, an analemma. And what do we see at Lascaux? We see this cave entrance lined up with a solstice sunset. My, my computer program shows this as being in October, but uh, at any rate, um, it's the solstice sunset. And, and here you have a depiction of what was happening at this particular time. And again, it's another example of small-scale egalitarian people being concerned about these, these standstill times of the sun. Um, it may be that the sun may die and never come back, or it may, it may come to life again. Um, but it's, in a sense, honoring or even attempting to make sure that the sun behaves in a way that life will, will, will unfold as it should. And they may have been using a horizon calendar to figure this out. Um, just one last comment here uh, by this archaeologist. Pato, we're here. You see, the cave is there. The cave is there, indeed. Bernifal is here. The moot is here. What she's discovered is that one particular cave... ...of year when the sun lit up the shelter. This salmon is represented with a curved lower jaw, a characteristic of a kelt or post-spawn fish and spawning only occurs in the winter. We have this salmon on the ceiling. It's pointing in the direction of the rising winter sun. So the argument she's trying to make oh, is, that, is that this particular area has importance in terms of seasonality. And she does make a kind of curious claim here that I want to show you. According to experts, the fur color of the bison on the left is a sign that it is molting, while the erection of the bison on the right so indicates it is rutting. These represent two seasons. This is measurements, and just to go Stand. quickly through this, she sees this. They cross at 90 degrees. If there were a transparent wall here, behind the eye of the bison on the right, you would have the rising winter sun. Behind the eye of the bison on the left, you would have the rising summer sun. And at the point where the two tails cross, you would have the rising spring and autumn suns. The image corresponds to reality. Bison's rot in autumn and molt in so spring. I, I tried to recreate this, and so I've overlaid winter and summer, winter and and a summer sun. And in fact, she's not far off. You can see uh, here's the um, uh, the summer sun rising around the eye of this bison, and the winter sun rising here. Now this has doesn't have to be particularly accurate. I don't know why she's measuring it to the degree. Um, but but you can you can see where she's coming from, but this isn't that different from other people's concern about the solstices who were hunters and gatherers, and so there are arguments about whether constellations are seen and uh, and um, and uh, and that remains to be seen because we we don't have much knowledge of representation of the constellations by hunters and gatherers at this uh, in any particular time. So I'm trying, what I'm trying to point out, just wrap up in a couple of sentences here, is that astronomical knowledge is culturally specific. And we don't expect to see um, highly sophisticated knowledge of the cosmos among people who didn't need to know that kind of thing. Uh, so on a need to know basis, egalitarian hunter and gatherers needed to know when to conduct certain rituals, when animals might be migrating, when to expect wa waterfowl migrating, and so forth. And the position of the sun, perhaps the Pleiades and others, would help you understand that. As society became more complex, the need for greater knowledge 
also became more important. And that's when we begin to see at Mayan sites, for example, a more complex relationship with the cosmos. And we certainly see that in our society today. So um, that's a brief, um, a brief look at the world of archaeoastronomy with a few conclusions. And, um, and certainly using these um, fringe people as a foil, was able, we were able to take a look at how sort of wrong they are and how, um, and how we need to be really culturally appropriate to make these kinds of interpretations. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll uh, leave that to you. So Randy, we can, we can get some questions now. Thanks very much, Gary. Well, that was really fascinating. Um, uh, I'll give people a chance to, uh, to type in questions and Fred has already come up with a question. Any idea why most Aboriginal medicine wheels are found mostly in Western Canada and some in Northern USA? Uh, no, no, not, not particularly. I mean, they may have, um, there may be some ancestry. They may have originated in one group of people out there and spread. So there may be some historical contingency. But given the nature of the prairies, these kinds of stone circles would certainly be more visible and would, um, would probably be, um, uh, be um, related to their cultural attributes. So for example, we talked about um, bison hunting rituals, uh, which were far more common out in that part of the world. So these are culturally specific, regionally specific, and uh, we certainly don't find them out here in the East. Um, other than that, um, I, I, I can't really give a more specific uh, answer. Is it possible that a lot of the, it seems a lot of these structures that you, you showed us are in desert areas. And so is it possible that there might have been other structures that just didn't survive the ages due to weathering and climate? Yeah, um, um, the, the, I mean, really it brings up the issue of, um, of how do archaeologists find sites. And this is, uh, this is a, a tough one. And um, for example, that Nabta Playa site was found with the assistance of local people. And there were just hints of it and it had to be excavated. So absolutely, there's so much material that, that remains to be uncovered that, um, that we are probably still just scratching the surface. And that's why you know we we spend a great deal of time looking at larger edifices such as the pyramids and um, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, it, it it requires some concerted questions. So if you if you think something might be going on in an area, then you have to design a survey. You have to make contacts with local people and start exploring. But absolutely, um, it, it there's a sampling issue here for sure. Hey, uh, next question is actually uh, uh, very interesting. And we look forward to the answer to this from, from Keith. Are there any pre-Copernican representations of the solar system that place the sun at the center um, and, uh, or uh, at the earth, place the sun at the center or the earth at the center? Uh, did ancient cultures seem disinterested in figuring this out? Uh, well, from my, my specialization is in pre-literate societies and we have, no information about that at all. As I say, the um, uh, the hunters and gatherers uh, were were simply interested in in the solstices, it seems, and and sort of timing when hunting would take place. And I think this idea of modeling the solar system uh, in a particular way is a is a relatively um, you know it's a relatively modern uh, approach to trying to understand cosmology. Uh, the the and I mean, even today, cosmology is, is linked to religion. And uh, I like to think of astrology as, as sort of a, a one type of belief, belief system like that. But, but no, um, uh, to my knowledge, if we look at the Maya, the Inca, the Egyptians, we go to China, we go to uh, earlier societies. Um, no, no. And, and it would be very difficult to, to figure out too. And, um, and one of the big problems in some of these areas is that the, the colonizers, like the Spanish, you know, they love to burn stuff and literature. And we have lost so much information about what, um, what uh, indigenous people knew, particularly indigenous people who kept written records. So uh, 
there, there are serious problems there, but my, but my answer is really briefly, no, I don't know of any. Um, I remember when I was in university, there seemed to be a new movie out, a Von Daniken movie or a UFO movie or a, a Carillion photography movie out every other week. Uh, what was the, what was so special about the 70s and this kind of, uh, you know, interest because, you know, you know, you think about how many of these movies have survived or if anyone's making any new ones now, there haven't been any for 40 years. Yeah, the, um, well, the literature is out there and the internet has taken over, but, but the flourishing in the 70s, um, it related to sort of um, everything from the new age, the rise of new age um, belief systems. Um, there are a couple of books that uh, were published. There was a French book, I'm trying to remember the, the name of it, that, um, that really caught people's attention. Um, uh, Von Donneken's business is actually rooted in H.P. In, in Lovecraft's science fiction writing going back even earlier. But it really came into its own in the 60s and early 70s. And I link that to the space program to a large extent. Um, the, the, we were reaching out. We had this competition between the Russians and the Americans. This, this seemed like astronauts were going up every week. We have the, the moon explorations and so forth. And I think there's a very close link to that. Um, today, though, we're seeing it develop into a whole new world. When I started teaching a course on this business in 2012, we weren't using the phrase fake news. Um, that evolved over the last eight years and my course changed along with that. And I think we have to ask questions today about why people are so enamored with these, what we in, in my scientific world refer to as fringe ideas and these fringe ideas. I, I joke with my students, I said, you know, while we're here, Google Graham Hancock and tell me how many hits you get and then Google me and how many you get. And I was sort of reassured every year my number would go up and up and up. But there's no way I can keep up with the millions upon millions of hits that people like Graham Hancock and Von Donneken get. People, they either love to hate them or they love them. And, um, and to some extent, an answer to that would help us understand what's happening in um, in politics these days, uh, but uh, let's not go there. Okay. Uh, one of our viewers is interested in the dig that's behind you. Is that one of yours and, and where is it? Um, that was a dig related to some of my work. Um, it, it's indirectly related to research project that I'm working on. So that's, uh, that's in, uh, in, in South Central Hokkaido in Northern Japan. And uh, Hokkaido, as many of you may know, is the home of uh, an indigenous people called the Ainu, A-I-N-U, the Ainu. And this excavation was taking place in an Ainu community next to a river that the Japanese government was damming. And so this excavation for me is symbolic of the struggle for indigenous rights, the um, Ainu rights. So the Ainu people tried to make a deal with the Japanese government. They have no, they have no fishing rights, for example. They have no hunting rights. Um, essentially, they are barely recognized as an indigenous people. This year they, or last year they were, and there is now a national museum to the Ainu that opened um, a month or two ago in Hokkaido, but they're still very much second-class citizens. And the Ainu used this opportunity of this dam construction to try to gain some rights. So they tried to block the uh, building of this dam and the deal would be you give us rights and you get your dam. Well, the dam went in anyway and uh, there is so much Ainu heritage in this community that there was a massive excavation related to that dam construction and um, and that's what's going on behind me. Nothing to do with astronomy that I know of, but, uh, but actually further down river, there is a shrine to UFOs, but I don't want to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question about the Mayan calendar. A lot of references are made to the accuracy of the Mayan calendar. Clearly lots of pre-literate cultures had a great sense of the seasons. 
Are there other formal calendars of comparable accuracy? What makes the Mayan calendar so notable? Not, not that I know of, at least at that time and in, um, and in those contexts, the, 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 the Mayans were, were really ahead of the game. Well, as were the Aztec, and sometimes we, we conflate the two. Um, but they were making these precise um, um, calendrical observations. The, we're still, people still have a little trouble figuring out what the 260-day calendar was all about. But they were able to predict uh, they were calculating eclipses. They were, they were, um, um, as as people know, they were, they were quite sophisticated in this kind of knowledge. And what perplexes us is um, what the knowledge foundation was to be able to do that. You can sort of extrapolate back and say they had it, but we we don't really understand the specifics of how they, of how they did that. Um, but no, they really did have a pr particularly accurate calendar. Um, I mean, certainly the, you know, I'm, I'm excluding groups like the Chinese, for example, but um, I'm just, I'm, I'm speaking about, uh, see, uh, non um, sort of high level state societies. The Mayans were, were not, well, there's some debate about what their social system was all about, but um, yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely astounding what they were able to accomplish. Gary, thanks very much. On behalf of everyone watching in today from uh, across the country in the RASC, I'd like to thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, everyone can applaud you using the reactions <laughs> at the bottom there or on their on their screen. But uh, thanks very much. Appreciate all all the work you went into make this presentation for us. Well, thanks. It's been it's been great talking to you about these ideas. And maybe once we all get back together again, we can talk some more. That'd be great. Thank you. Anyway, uh, have a good weekend and happy Halloween. Yes, happy Halloween, everybody. So I'll just uh, <laughs> close off today with uh, uh, a notice about our next talk is in, uh, in two weeks. Our speaker is Leslie Sage. He's the astronomy editor at Nature Magazine and a contributing editor to the RESC Journal. And uh, I haven't got an official title from him, but I think his, his uh, presentation is going to be very interesting. So he's going to talk about about his uh, experiences about uh, being an editor for an astronomy editor for Nature Magazine. So that's, uh, that's going to be fascinating. And then uh, later on in November, uh, on the 27th, uh, our speaker will be Michael Daly from York University, who is a, a project scientist on the OSIRIS-REx mission. Of course, everyone's been following that and the uh, successful uh, uh, material collection on the surface uh, just last week. So uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Daly will have some uh, up-to-date information regarding that. So with that, uh, I don't think we have anything else. So I wanna wish everyone uh, a great uh, uh, weekend, a great uh, Halloween. Everyone stay safe and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks everybody. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.